on time. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Exploiting Bug Reports in the Games Industry. Uh, just quick reminder, sell us your phones if you haven't yet. I don't care, but other people might. Um, usual stuff. Thank you so much for the event organizers for taking in uh, my talk. It's um, This is exciting. Uh, I, I'm not used to uh, talking in um, security because I'm usually in tech and games industry, so so this is different. I, I hope you enjoy it. So my name is uh, Andrea Gaito. You can call me Shana. Everybody else does. Uh, I am a uh, freelance uh, recently. Well, m most of the time, uh, on and off. I'm a cross-platform uh, developer. I do uh, mostly open source stuff, unless someone pays me enough not to. Um, I do tools, runtimes, libraries, engines, language bindings. Uh, so, so everything except the UI. I don't like doing UI. It's it's annoying. Um, so, uh, this these are some of the platforms that I develop for, or that my code is. Uh, uh, running on. I spent basically a bunch of my time taking things that were made to run on uh, one platform and, and uh, making them run on another one. Uh, I spent a lot of time porting uh, software. I spent a lot of time re-implementing uh, software in clean room environments, so I don't have access to the source. Even if I did, I can look at it because it would taint the re-implementation. And basically just take a thing that was there and either make it run somewhere else in the same way or re-implement it so you have the same behavior. Uh, sometimes, um, basically on any given day, today I have a Windows machine because we're gonna talk about games, so it's kinda like <laughs> Windows. Uh, I might be on a Mac, I might be on Linux, I might be on something else, uh, I don't really care. I'm very OS agnostic, I, I hate them all, so it's it's fine. Thank you so much for coming today instead of uh, all packing into the Albertini workshop, which I'm sure you would want to. I would want to be there too. Uh, I am happy to take the leftovers that couldn't fit in there. So, and I hope you, you enjoy this. Um, today, the agenda is bug reports in uh, the games industry. We're going to talk about game, not the companies that make games, but the companies that make software to make the games, which is sometimes the same company, most of the times not. Uh, so we're going to specifically talk about commercial off-the-shelf game uh, development software, uh, which is the most popular and easy to, to access. Uh, and we're going to look at the vulnerable processes that, um, that exist in these companies and kind of exist by the virtue of how the software game development works and how the game engines work and like the features that they have that allow people to make games are also the, the features that end up um, end up with this talk basically so um, let's look at that but before looking at the bug reports let's talk a bit about game engines because we kind of need to understand what they are in order to fig to understand how how the vulnerabilities happen uh, so, we're going to focus on popular game engines because, again, off-the-shelf software um, is is popular and has a very large user base, which is where the vulnerable processes start to break down when there's um, a lot of users. Uh, we're going to focus on Unreal and uh, Unity because they're um, popular game engines that are very accessible to anyone out there with millions of... Of, of users of the engines themselves. It's teams that are one person team making a game to 100, 200 te uh, person teams uh, making the game with this engine, basically. So they, they have a large amount, uh, they have a large user base, and they have to deal with a massive amount of data daily going in and out uh, for supporting uh, these game engines. So unlike how you ship a game where you make it and you ship it and you never touch that code again. It's a one-off game is disposable code that just has to do that thing and done. Game engines live a long time, need to be maintained, and need to be supported. 
um, and real. I'm going to be like basic because I've like, this is a completely different audience for me. So I have no idea what the baseline is. So I'm going to give you information that you probably might or might not know. I'm sorry, but we're going to go through that quickly. Uh, Unreal is the game engine that borrows Fortnite, PUBG, a lot of FPSs, um, made by Epic. Uh, and it's C, C, C++ engine with C++ on top. Um, Unity powers Earthstone, uh, Kerbal Space Program, CD Skylines, it, um, made by, uh, Unity. Um, seven out of ten, top 10 mobile games on all the mobile asset stores are, are Unity and a large portion of anything that you see on Steam as well. Uh, there's other, there's other engines, uh, like Source, uh, Lumberyard, a bunch of other stuff. Each company basically either buys a license for a commercial engine or they make their own. And when they make their own, unless they want to sell it or maintain it, it's a closed source engine. They might license it out to very specific teams, but that doesn't give us access to their processing system. And, uh, so this is why I'm focusing on these engines, which anyone can, can access. Even though technically they're paid, they're not actually paid. Unreal, if you download Unreal, it's free unless you make 300,000 of revenue for for your game, and you give them a, a percent of the profit after that. So unless you're successful, you can just use it forever. Uh, uh, Epic gives you access to their source code. So once you, you just create an account in, in Epic, and you can download the engine, and you can just go and look at the source code. And when you're doing games on Unreal, you're compiling your game against a version of the source code. So you have access to the whole source code right there. Uh, Unity is a proprietary uh, closed uh, source, uh, source code, so you don't get access to the source code unless you pay them. You can you can buy access to the source code. Uh, but uh, Unity has a, a large layer of C-sharp that powers a lot of their um, their features. So, and all of that is, is mostly uh, open. So, you know, you get half of the engine uh, available as source code. So, uh, what is a game engine? <laughs> Um, game engines. So, in the beginning, in the before times, the game engine was basically the game. You want to run a game in, cert in whatever hardware is popular, whatever Apple II, PC, whatever that was popular at the time. You're a game developer, you want to make a game, you make the game engine. Because you're making the thing that you're pushing the hardware to the max, and you're just trying to get as much performance and speed and power from the hardware as possible. So you're coding this thing to that specific architecture to take advantage of the way the hardware renders the pixels on the screen and any bugs that the architecture have, you'll take advantage of that. So in the beginning, game engines are like literally like one-off pieces of a thing that can only run on this. But it takes six months to do this, and then your publisher goes like, hey, your game was popular in this platform, but that platform is like dead now because there's another platform, like another console that's popular now. Can you make your run game run on that? And so people go like, okay, cool, now I have to go and look at the other platform and rewrite my entire game to try and run it on another platform. Over time, abstractions started showing up, right? You want to be fast at this. You don't want to spend six months to a year every time you want to uh, ship a game. Even the game is done, but you have to rewrite it all the time. So you start building abstractions on top of the platform so that you can still have the speed and access to the hardware, but you don't have to rewrite the engine every time. So over time, some layers came up, came up on top of the, the raw hardware uh, of the game engine. And you have the runtime. The runtime for a game engine is C and C++, um, or whatever other language that can give you data alignment features uh, in memory, access, direct access to memory, direct access to the GPU as much as possible, the lowest level hardware access that you can. You don't want to be fighting the language while trying to put your uh, byte arrays in memory so that you can ship them directly to the graphics card without having to copy memory over. Uh, and the reason you need to do this for a game engine is not be only because you, you want to make sure 
your players shoot. When they shoot, they hit the target that they are looking at, not the target somewhere else. And you can actually see the little bullets in real time. But also, for a very a more concrete example of why speed is and performance and all these things are in, important in a game engine, if you've ever played around with VR, put a VR headset on, um, if the time that it takes for you to move your head, like turn around or look at some, something on the screen, uh, something on the world that's getting uh, rendered through the headset, the time that it takes for you to move your head and for the image to update in front of your eyes is more than 16 milliseconds, you will get nauseous and vomit. So you can easily break a human just by taking more than 60 milliseconds from the time it takes to move your head to the time it takes for those pixels, photons, to hit your eyeballs. 16 milliseconds is a very short time to figure out how to update a virtual world in order to show an updated image just because you moved your head a bit. And any, any delay in that is going to make you sick. And some people have even a lower tolerance. 16 milliseconds is only 60 frames per second. Some people need more than that, need 90 or 120 in order to not get sick. So that's a very practical example of how you need speed and performance to minimize all of this as much as possible. So um, game engines evolved for speed and performance on top of the hardware very, very, very fast. But now there's more and more game developers um, that need to make games. And the problem with this is making a game is not actually at all about speed and performance. These are the people that are a part of a game development team. You can see three engine programmers in there. Those are the people that are actually touching the engine and know all of the bits. Everybody else, network programmers are dealing with the network code, generalists, 3D artists, animators, artists, all of these people are creating content for the game. They're putting, they're creating levels, they're, they're creating narratives, they're designing experiences, they're making mechanics, they're building all of this content for the games that you play, and none of them know how to make the engine go. And if you give them an engine where in order to, for them to write a dialogue for a character, they have to go into the engine directly and change the things in the engine, they'll spend more time breaking the engine than they'll do making the dialogue. So again, another layer has to come in in order to support all of these artists and designers and people to make the game. Making games is more like a Hollywood production. It's the only tech industry that has producers as part of a core team. Nobody else knows what a producer is, but games developers know because it's more of an experience than programming. Programming is the side effect of making all of this. And so, again, game engines evolved more layers, specifically scripting layers, on top of the engine that provide different tools for the designers to build these games. So the more common languages are C Sharp, Lua, Scheme. If you've ever played Uncharted, the entire game was coded in Scheme by the designers. It's a variant of Lisp. It's a functional language that they had no problems with because they're not programmers, so for them, it's... It's fine. It's a thing. They script it. It's okay. Um, and this stuff sits on top of the engine. And the other nice advantage that you have with this is that uh, now you have a completely separate layer that's running game code as opposed to engine code that's running logic of the game. So you can reload it at will because this is running on uh, an interpreter or compiled into bytecode, but it's running on a VM, you can, the engine can shut down this VM and restart it at will. So a, a, a programmer, an artist, anyone that's doing game content can just rewrite their game scripts, reload it while the game is running, and see the effects in real time. These prototyping tools are essential. This is how you build the experiences. Um, so... These hot reloadable features are amazing, and I'm going to show you how they work so that you can have some idea of uh, what we're talking about here uh, before we get to the the bug reports. Kill this. Right. 
Okay, so this is Unreal. Uh, Unreal uh, is a C++ engine with a C++ scripting layer on top. Um, and I, and all of, not only the game is scriptable, but the editor itself is scriptable. All that you see here in the editor itself is dynamically uh, compiled without shutting down the editor. So I just made it a little simple, like I added a, a, a little toolbar button with a simple window. It's literally one of their examples of how to extend the editor itself. And I can just go and uncomment this. And recompile. You can do it, Unreal. You can do it. It's okay. Come on. There we go. Um, and now, instead, come on, come on, reload. Did it not reload? Cool. First demo um, uh, broke before because I have to kill Unreal every time I sleep my laptop, otherwise it crashes because it's really good software. It's quality stuff. Anyways, second demo. This is Unity. Now Unity again, C++, C++ uh, engine, but this time the, the scripting layer on top is uh, C Sharp. It's running mono uh, on the back. Uh, so uh, you can see these uh, menus, uh, menus on top. Again, all of this, uh, this, the entire editor is, all of this is running C Sharp. And whenever I do any change to the code, and in this case, I'm going to, again, put as a little menu, a little window thing. If you take if you take a look at it's compiling. If you take a look at the um, the menu on top, we're going to have a a little thing as soon as as soon as it starts compiling. There you go. And now we have a menu. What this literally did, like everything that you see here, is running on the mono VM uh, and talking to the engine. Whenever all any of this change happens, the engine recompiles your code. And if it is successfully compiles, it shuts down the entire VM and reloads all of the DLLs back up, everything. The reason you can't see that the entire editor just got shut down and reloaded back up, it's because it's being rendered by the engine, which is C++ and it never shut down. So you're seeing stale pixels on the screen while it's reloading your entire game code and your entire editor code. And all of this, all of this stuff is dynamically recompiled on the fly, uh, basically, in order to give you really fast prototyping tools. Uh, and I'm not even, this, this is animating and I'm not running the game. This is just a scene view. I can do whatever I put, put cubes on the screen and, and anything, but it's already running your game code. This would be the actual game. Uh, view while this is just a scene that I can move around and, and do whatever I want with it. So, bug reports. Okay. Um, so, Bug reports. Say you're a project maintainer, you have a, a, a project on GitHub somewhere, and someone opens an issue. And you usually have a little, little template where you go, like, if you open an issue, give me the steps to reproduce the problem. And they open an issue and, and, and attach a zip file, like, 100 meg zip file to it. And in the reproducible steps, go like, if I click on this button, the, the, your project crashes. Please take the zip file that I have attached and run it. Would you do it? Right. So, now imagine that instead of the zip file being, instead of your project having an ability for someone to just go like, you know, like, just 
do these two lines of code and then run it and it will crash. The only way to reproduce a bug is to load up a project of two gig project because that's the only way to reproduce the bug. Uh, you'd probably think, well, that's a problematic bug, you know, like it's one of a kind, but this is literally what happens every day in the games industry because the smallest game I've ever worked on was a two gig repo, two gigs of data. It had three levels on it. It would compile in about 10 minutes, which is really fast. Games, that was just the smallest thing. Games, game projects, the raw stuff in order to actually run the game, run 10, 30, 50, 100 gigs. Easy, easy, because of all the content. So when you're making a game and, and you're all of those people, artists, animators, designers, and you're making a game and the editor crashes on you, the engine has a problem and it literally blocks you from shipping your game because the engine has a problem. You file a bug report with the company and this is, this is an example. This is the Unity bug report system. Uh, it's built into the editor. Um, and when you do file bug report, it opens the bug reporter and automatically attaches your entire project to it, whatever the size of the project is. Because in order to, for them to reproduce the problem, they need your project. It's very rare that you can just say, you know, click on this thing. These engines are mature enough that it's no longer a thing, of, a question of clicking on one button and crashing. There's all complex systems interacting uh, with this. But of course, they recommend that you don't submit your entire project and please cut it down to a small size so that we can actually, you know, take not half an hour to load the project. There's a reason why I had all of Unreal and Unity running on this machine already before the presentation because, you know, it's going to take five minutes to load these projects. And these are example projects. Literally, load me an example project that they ship. Uh, similarly, for Unreal, this is a screenshot of a bit of the bug. Uh, when you want to report a bug, uh, it will open a web page so that you can fi fill out the, the bug issue uh, report. And one of the things that go like download link to test project so that you can put your pro project in there. Uh, so now, bug report. Um, you're filing a bug report. Uh, if you're nice about it, you know, you're not in a too much of a hurry. You have some time. You cut down your bug report to something that maybe 500 megs, one gig, 1.5 gigs, and you throw it at, uh, at them. And the first people that are going to look at it is QA. Because again, these engines have millions of teams using them. They have thousands of issues getting filed daily. Uh, so issue triage, it's not the engine developers that are going to touch it directly, it's QA. So now QA is, is going to look at it. And um, they're going to, the first test, if the bug is reproducible, they're going to look at what version of the engine. If it's a modern version that they still support, they're going to check whether the bug is reproducible. They'll, and they're going to read the reproducing steps. And the reproducing steps are usually open this thing and do this thing, and, and then it crashes or does something. And they're going to open it up and run it. Because that's the only way to test this. Now, ideally, they do this in a VM. Because... Again, there's a lot of stuff in there. But to have this in a VM requires a VM infrastructure. Maybe your bug is related to an NVIDIA graphics card. It only, sh it only crashes if it's on a 1080 or a 2080 or whatever, right? And uh, now try and get a VM to um, give you uh, graphics cards for that. Uh, so... Okay, so the bug is validated. No matter how it went through QA, your bug is valid. Now we're going to escalate it to, to the developer. If there is some chance that the QA didn't go through a VM when validating a bug, there's even less of a chance that, that the engine developer is going to do this uh, because the engine developer has all the tools on their machine 
they're not going to spin up a VM just to test the project that's already been through QA and validated as a valid problem. They want to fix the problem, so they're going to go and look at it. Now, if you play games, if you, do, do you disable your antivirus when you play games? Or do you kind of like, you know, do kind of an exception on your game folder just so that your antivirus doesn't kill your game while you're running it? Yeah. Try that a hundred times when you're when your build machine is a game build machine and ha every other executable triggers a false positive and the antivirus just yanks out the build artifacts while you're building and uh, antivirus is the first thing to go on a developer a, a engine developer machine. I googled game antivirus and this was literally the first hit on Google. This was literally the first hit. This is not a good thing. Not a good thing. So the developer machine, not likely to be very protected. Also, it runs everything. It literally has 100 compilers, PowerShells, like whatever software you might imagine it runs, it's there. So you can't even test whether something bad is running on it because it will literally be running everything. How many compilers can you possibly have? Unity ships with two compilers, a node, uh, and node, I think. Uh, Unreal ships with two different Python uh, interpreters, one node, and two, I think, at least one Clang. So, you know, there's, and this is, this is just the game engines, not the developers themselves. Uh, so it's a security nightmare by the point you get to a developer machine. And, and so the point of this talk <laughs> is like, how do you get there? So let's look at a demo. So the problem here is not just to see the game code that I just put a menu on there. It's also that all, for you to have access to audio engines, uh, platform SDKs, like you doing a thing for, console, for consoles, anything. All of these ship as native libraries because they, the, because basically they're hooking up into, um, below the, 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 your scripting layer, basically. So all the, these things ship the, as, as native libraries, which means all of the, all of the editors as part of your prototyping, uh, process will load all of these libraries automatically. So I have a little library. Um, I have a little library, it's very small, that imagine I filed my bug report, and as part of my bug report, I was actually nice, called it down a bit, and shipped all of the SDKs that I need, like the native libraries that are part of my, my game, and also shipped the source of those, because, because, because I'm nice. I don't have to, but I'm nice. And the source looks like this. So when you see the source of that DLL that's in there, it looks like this. But when I call it, this is, this is the example library function that we see over here has nothing. It, it is empty. It should not do anything. But I'm just gonna put this on a static constructor and call it. And of course, the editor very politely automatically compiles this for me. And yeah, that's totally not what the library had at all. And this is, this is the, the problem. Like, if all of this code is going to be running as soon as you run the editor, it's not even when I'm touching the code. As soon as the editor loads a project, it's going to execute everything that's marked for execution during editor mode, for instance. And anything that you can possibly do you can do, right? And you're going to be shipping native libraries with this. The examples ship native libraries that are already pre-compiled. It's not like the examples, you know, compile the source into the libraries. Everything's already shipped as native library. So by the point, by the time that any, someone, either QA or the developer, opens this project to figure out whether this bug, what this bug does, they're done, basically. And there's no escape. Because that's how this works. Like, literally, this is how it works. 
uh, that is the point of the fast prototyping tools. And uh, this would happen in Visual Studio because Visual Studio would also be a plug-in model where you can, you know, you just, you can install any plugins and they can do whatever. But those plugins are distributed by Microsoft in a store that's curated and made sure that it doesn't have malicious code. So the distribution model is different there, and there's a trust that the plugin is not going to be doing anything bad because Microsoft's already vetted it. But this is unknown code. Anyone can send this to any of these companies, which process this as part of a normal process of verifying that this code runs and, and crashes. Um, so... This is obviously not something that affects you directly as the end users. These, this is a, an exploitation that is a vulnerability for the companies that make these engines or companies that have similar processes. Anyone that needs to run an unknown code because they're porting stuff will just do this as a matter of fact. Uh, on the red team side for this, to find, to exploit this, you would find the bug that passes, that would reasonably pass QA, basically. The issue trackers are public, so you can go and find, uh, things that crash. Crasher bugs are the most critical, so you usually get the most attention. But when you crash the editor, you do not want to be in the stack trace, because otherwise you would get blamed and not the editor, and your bug would get thrown out. Uh, so you might end up in QA, but not anywhere else further into the network. But of course, there's a million different native SDKs out there that you can just install. So, you know, mimicking as one of those is fairly easy. Uh, small projects are uh, more likely to be looked at than large ones because, because if it's a small contained reproducible bug, it's nice. They, they enjoy that. On the food team side, uh, the process is obviously like, it's a question of process and, and human training. Uh, all of these things need to be considered as potentially uh, evil-tainted code. It's unknown. You don't know what it does. Uh, even though you, as a on the on the company side, you might not be used to people abusing this system. But still, VMs are important, and they already have them because they already have to build and ship for a hundred platforms. So they already have built farms with VMs and custom hardware to do all the testing in the native hardware itself. Uh, it's, it's more of a question of um, being aware that on this side, this is also a problem and building the infrastructure accordingly, um, which is something that's, that's happening. Like uh, uh, it's, it's already being built. It's just a question of, putting that into the processes uh, for, for the, the teams that are managing this to make sure this is not abused. And of course, it's, again, like, there's a small subset of companies that have to deal with this very specific particular exploit, and it's uh, you have to kind of know how to exploit it, so ignorance is bliss sometimes, I guess. I don't know. Um, in any case, um, that is, we have reached the end of my slides, uh, and that's it. that is uh, exploiting bug reports in the game industry. Um, we have some time for questions, I guess, five minutes maybe. Yeah, a few questions should be doable. Hi. Uh, do you think this makes us vulnerable through a supply chain attack, or is it just uh, for the game develop uh, engine developers? Uh, I mean, like, it would be always possible for someone to breach an internal network, get publishing keys from um, a store, but it's not likely that it would end up to the user, the, the person playing the game, because it's like you are far removed from something. By the time you get to play the game, there's a lot of verification that needed to happen in order for that game to ship. So something that's malicious is not likely to reach you as the end user of the player. But other development teams that are consuming con consuming packages from someone that's been breached, they are more likely to suffer. So this is more of a kind of a exploitation of internal networks of all of these companies that are linked together, basically. Unless, you know, you as the player. Okay.
Well, thank All you right. so much. Thank you very much.